Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, along with my producer, Steph, and we are streaming live from the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy Studio today. And I am super excited to have Dr. Kathleen Brown on our um, podcast today. She is a dermatologist. I've been trying to get a dermatologist on our podcast for years now. I'm super excited to have her on. She is going to be be talking about direct pay, and the followers of this podcast are very familiar with direct pay and how it saves patients money and it actually increases access. So she's going to be talking about her story about why she went into direct pay and she's going to be talking about um, skin cancer and the importance of screening and and um, um, treating and all that and how it can be affordable in a direct pay model. So um, Dr. Kathleen Brown, without further ado, uh, welcome to our show. Very happy to be here with you. Yeah, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it and um and what I really appreciate is that you, you know, you saw a need to make some changes and in in your practice and you said um, that it was the Affordable Care Act uh, earlier in our show, before the show when we were talking, that, that kind of made you make some changes to your practice and go with direct care. Can you kind of talk about um, that moment and why you made those changes? Well, I was really opposed to that uh bill before it passed and um, I just already had it with bureaucratic requirements, difficulty with uh, how much time I was spending documenting, um, just I mean hours and hours every week um, and stupid requirements and kind of living in fear of auditing. I'm very careful and very conscientious, including my documentation. And it was already too much, and I saw that this was gonna mean more. And uh, my my workload was increasing, my pay was decreasing. Um, I had a bad payer mix within my group, and so I just already kind of reached a point where I'd had enough, and then there was gonna be more. Well, good for you for doing that. And then you went into a direct care model. Can you tell us a little bit about a direct care model? Yeah, so my husband and I owned a commercial building and he had his business there. He does um, IT and information technology work. And so we renovated a space. I don't think I I could have done it by myself. Um, You need help. We renovated the space. We planned it for a year. And we opened it kind of like I'd had in my head for years of an ideal practice of post uh, prices, make them transparent, uh, bill by time. People can have as much time or as little time as they need, very upfront about pricing and really putting care first and not letting the third party payer run your business for you. I I love it. Um, You know, what a concept, transparent pricing in healthcare something that's kind of very difficult to get anymore. Although that's not completely true because if you find the right places and the right doctors and the right healthcare facilities, you can get transparent pricing. And that's one of the reasons we have um, doctors like yourself on to educate and empower individuals that they can have, they have choices. They don't have to go to who their insurance company tells them to go to. And in fact, that person might not be, um, the best doctor or the most qualified, the best care or the best price. Is that correct? Correct. I think a lot of times it's catering to people who really care, care about price, uninsured, high deductible. But the more important thing is prioritizing care. I was getting to the point where I wasn't um, able to sustain the way that I was practicing and um, I was pretty stubborn and I had not changed and so that's partly why I was experiencing the difficulties I was. Um, I think the more common thing to do, you know, move to a different practice, a different place, um, change the way that care is provided. I feel like a lot of rationalization goes on that care is still just as good and, you know, when you're delegating things that you would do, I think it's difficult enough practicing medicine well and properly. And if you're delegating to other people, people who have had less training and less experience, how are you saying that that is the same? And I don't think it's the same. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, we see this all the time now. We see, you know, um, a healthcare professional that they will move from 
one clinic to the next clinic thinking that that situation is going to be better. And the reality of it is it's a system problem, right? I mean, you already said it. It's 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 third parties, it's insurance, the Affordable Care Act and all those regulations that come along with it. That's what makes it bad. So in st- in, until you can get out of the system, you really mm-hmm. can't change it. Is that correct? Very correct. It, it's it. I think it's incrementalism little bit by little bit, but it becomes a game. I did go to a seminar on kind of efficiency, maximizing the reimbursement. And um, it was very interesting, but but that's the game that people are playing and it's not prioritizing care. It's like, well, I have to do this because such and such. Well, do you really have to? If you stay in the, in the system, you do have to. At some point, you have to. Well, one thing that doc- doctors tell me often is after they get out of the system and they go into a direct direct patient care type model is how simple it really is. It doesn't have to be difficult or complicated. And, um, you know, the EMRs and all that kind of stuff complicate a lot of issues and you don't need a lot of that stuff because it really is a distraction to patient care. Yeah. And you make those decisions as to whether you use those things or not, whether they add to care rather than other reasons that are not as good. Right. Exactly. So let's get into some clinical stuff. Um, you you treat as a dermatologist. You you um, screen and treat a lot of um, cancer patients over the years. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So tell us the importance of screening and 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 not, not just the important. I guess what is a screening? I mean, for this is just for this is for me too. I mean, I'm 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 not very knowledgeable about this subject. So what does it mean to get screened for skin cancer? Do you have to wait until you have something that looks like skin cancer? No, and I think people in general should know the warning signs of, you know, if something's bleeding, it's not healing, um, have an odd looking mold that is changing, um, a tender lump growing on the skin. Those are some of the main signs, but skin cancer has such an extremely varied appearance. appearance. There's classic looking things and there's things that are really pretty dangerous that are very subtle. And that's, that's the most the biggest value of screening is finding things early, uh, such as melanoma, but also basal cell carcinoma can be found early and it doesn't usually kill people, but it's destructive and it's very common on the face. So if it's found early, you're going to have a higher chance of cure and a smaller scar. From what my understanding is, is that, you know, skin cancer is very, very treatable um, if detected early, correct? Correct, including melanoma, including uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which is one that does uh, kill people too, not as commonly because it's usually, people notice that it's usually tender and it grows quickly. And so that's one that usually people will call with that, that it bothers them and they notice it. But the difference between treating it when it's a half centimeter in diameter, you know, a third of an inch, uh, and over two centimeters in diameter is huge. You know, that's once they get a, a bit bigger, then you have risk of metastasis spread to lymph nodes and death. So um, early detection, uh, very important for skin cancer. And yet, you know, the, the U.S. Preventative Task Force has not ranked skin cancer screening as um, something that should be universally covered. That's where I think people need to know warning signs. And if they have, I think anybody is reasonable for a first kind of look at your skin. Are you high risk? Are you low risk? Do you know about what to look for? Um, how much of your skin is screened, I think is very much a doctor patient decision, ideally all of your skin. But, um, you know, again, I think that's an individual choice. So tell yeah. us about high, high risk. It, 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 who, is, who is high risk for skin cancer? Uh, certainly very fair skin people. Uh, we rank skin amount of color in the skin. Melanin, we all have the same number of color producing cells, but people who are very dark skin produce a lot more melanin pigment, which is protective. And so someone who's a type one, there's type one through type six, roughly. Uh, Type one would be kind of a redhead freckled. And then if that person has had bad sunburns, blistering sunburns early in life, um, they're at higher risk. And then people who have many moles, especially odd looking moles, are at increased risk, particularly for melanoma. And um, so isn't it true too that 
melanoma is pretty aggressive once it's metastasized and the treatment or the um, prognosis is much worse when melanoma yeah. is metastasized. Is that correct? It's like a pretty aggressive cancer once it metastasized, correct? Yes, and it's not the most aggressive skin cancer. There's a rare one called Merkel cell carcinoma. Very rare, but very, very bad. So early on, often slow growing early on before there's any risk of it metastasizing. So it's really correlated with depth. So you can have one that's very obviously melanoma that's been there a long years that is still low risk because it's very thin. You can have others that are high risk and barely visible because they are thicker. So there's just all this uh, variation. It's been many, many years for me, but is so, excuse my ignorance if, I, if I'm going down the wrong, um, the wrong uh, road. But isn't there, is it still uh, like you, you talked about molds changing mm-hmm. um, and looking at them. Is there still an A, B, C? And I remember, yes. is there a D? Is there still, can you explain the A, B, C, D when it comes to yeah, um, looking at a mole? There's now A, B, C, D, E. E is for enlargement. A is asymmetry. It's not a mirror image. So you have a misshapen mole. Um, B is border, an irregular border, an outline to it. Um, C is color, if there's multiple colors. Uh, D is diameter, so that's a very rough cutoff of six millimeters or pencil eraser size. There's things that are smaller than that that are very bad. There's things that are larger than that that are fine, but it's a rough indicator of, of look at me, look, look at this small, pay attention to it. What is it doing? So, and then E, enlargement. So Based with growing, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, growing and odd looking. And sometimes people will not notice that they are growing. They will swear that it has not changed. And, um, you know, it's it's that, it's thin, you can't feel it. There's something called lentigo maligna on the face, a brown spot, it's been there for years. And uh, you measure it and say, well, I'm, can, can you come back in two months? Let's measure it again. And, you know, it's grown and you convince, convince them to biopsy it. <laughs> So. so tell us a little bit about treatment. If, if, if something like that does look suspect and they come to you, what, what is the treatment for it? The number one treatment is excision. There's other ways of physically removing a skin cancer, um, which are commonly performed also something called E, D, and C. Uh, it's a destructive method. You still need to take a specimen and send it to the lab and prove what it is. But um, excision, cutting it out and stitching it. And fortunately, the face is a very beautifully healing area. If uh, people have something excised properly there, usually things will heal with pretty much an imperceptible scar, not always, but um, very friendly area for healing. Um, And special techniques are needed in certain areas in the, the nose, nostril, eyelid margins, but Usually a properly done excision on the face um, will heal beautifully. And there are some things to do to enhance, improve the appearance, laser, um, sometimes just time, various things to help with the the healing process. But usually excision, cutting it out, numbing it up, cutting it out. Usually pretty pretty comfortable once you get the anesthetic in. And anesthetic's usually a little stingy going in. And isn't this, it might not be very new anymore, but I know it was pretty revolutionary when they um, kind of started it. But obviously, when you're cutting on somebody's um, skin, especially their face, you want the the um, incision or the, I guess, the damage to be as small as possible, but you want to get all the cancer. So yes. isn't there something called Mohs surgery? Is mm-hmm. that correct? Am I right? Yeah, Mohs is named after Frederick Mohs, who pioneered the technique has changed since then. But um there's areas where there's a whole list of criteria for when you really ought to have Mohs and when it's optional. It can minimize the margin, the extra normal skin, but it also maximizes the cure because sometimes you're taking a fairly wide margin, but you still have left some there because you can't see it very well. So it does both of those things. It, some people are afraid of Mohs because they know somebody who's had the Mohs technique, Mohs, Mohs micrographic surgery, and they ended up having a very large piece taken out. Well, they, they needed a very large piece taken out. That's, 
part of the you know part of the evaluating someone if it's if it's very poorly defined you're going to inform that patient well this could end up being larger than what we we think because you can't really see where it ends it's, it's and those are the, some of the ones there the again criteria scar like ones recurrent ones that really ought to have MOS. MOS is not needed in a lot of situations, but some areas it's very much increased the cure rate, uh, particularly for basal cell carcinoma. And isn't it something, <laughs> explain the technique a little bit, um, isn't it something that you just, you, you keep doing pathology until, because you got to do it in your office or something, you keep, you keep yes. extracting until there's no more um, pathological tissue, right? Yes, it's called stages. I don't do MOS. Most people doing MOS have done a fellowship, a couple extra years. And so part of that is the technique of examining the tissue. Part of that is being able to uh, excise larger, more difficult, you know, some techniques for repair. So there's, there's a lot involved with that, the more difficult tumors, but it's mapped. I like to describe it like a single crust pie, like a pumpkin pie. And you're taking out a piece that is saucer shaped, and then you cut it in quarters as you would put a pie in quarters. And then instead of slicing it like you would a bread loaf, all stacked in the same direction, you slice the piece, you freeze it. Instead of preserving it, you freeze it right away and you slice it kind of like right through the crust. So you're examining 100% of the border. It looks different that way. So there's special training needed to read it. It doesn't look like you're up and down slice. So that's mm. part of it, but you're examining 100% of the border so that you can see any little area. And because you've mapped it in quarters, at least initially, you know where to go back and take more. So the next piece is probably not saucer shaped but you start with that saucer shape. If it's clear on the first, you actually don't see any tumor. You've biopsied it ahead and proven what it is that you're taking out, making sure it's not something uh, more unusual. Um, and then you go back and you take more. So that would be a second stage. And once that second stage or third stage, or occasionally four or five or rarely six, once those are clear, then you know the size of the, what we call a defect that needs to be repaired. So you don't plan your repair until after you've taken out all the tumor. Then you plan your, you discuss with the patient, this is what we do to repair it, sometimes not repair it, let it grow in on its own, or a delayed repair, or a graft. So it's all quite an art. It's an art and science. That's pretty intriguing. But it's it's uh it's one of the ways to get the the tumor out with the least damage. Yes, and the highest cure. Right. And the highest cure is number one, tumor eradication. But then you're not taking out a bunch of normal normal skin. Right. Right. So, so tell us a little bit about direct care. Um, I know people mm -hmm. always get so afraid, especially when they hear of of cancer. They get so afraid about how expensive it's going to be. So. Um, Tell us, first of all, how in traditional practice with insurance-based practice, tell us some of the barriers that you saw that were accesses to care that actually became problematic when it came to treating a patient early with skin cancer. Can you give us, mm -hmm. let's start with that. So I'm sure you saw some barriers where there were, there were negative outcomes because of insurance um, when it came to treating mm -hmm. skin cancer. Can you explain? A lot of the people who have skin cancers treated are 65 and older and um, usually have Medicare A and B and a supplement. Um, so occasionally that remaining 20% if they don't have a supplement can be a barrier for people who, uh, if they also don't have Medicaid, then that if they end up having their cancer treated in a hospital or radiation or even outpatient surgery, that can be a lot. It's usually the younger patients who have a very high deductible or no insurance, smaller segment of the population. But I, I learned about those people from, you know, from my patients, particularly high deductibles that you know, it's like, oh, well, you have insurance, you shouldn't be worried about it. Well, they ended up with quite a significant bill. So I learned to ask in my traditional practice, what kind of insurance do you have? Not uh, to figure out 
how much I would get paid or anything like that, but just to know that they weren't going to get a surprise. Right. And um, sometimes you do things with the coating, like if you were freezing things off, pre-cancers, that you would not put down as many things as you did so that they would get a more reasonable bill. Um, but uh, in my direct pay practice since 2011 to 2019 in Oregon, um, I would still have people with Medicare who didn't have a supplement or who didn't have Medicare B, uh, who it would cost less for them to have things done in my office. But then when it would come time for an excision, you know, not just a biopsy or a bunch of biopsies, then I would offer them a referral for insurance reasons, um, it's particularly people who do have the supplement to have the full deal. And uh, then they got to decide whether they went outside my practice for cost reasons or had me do it. And sometimes people would choose to have me do it even though it would cost them less or cost them more because they felt comfortable. And sometimes they would think about that. I would never push people on that. I would say, why didn't you? You know, they say, well, how much would that cost if you do that for me? And I would estimate it and let them think about it overnight. And they would call back and let me or my staff know what their choice was. Sometimes an elderly person who's very frail, who, you know, they knew that we would not put them through everything you'd have going to the hospital or outpatient surgery, that they would be treated with. Just, you know, TLC. <laughs> you know, one of the things is, is I think what's Im so important about about what you're doing is just what you said, choice, is giving mm -hmm. patients choices. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of times they don't realize they have a choice. They just think that, you know, they have this insurance, they have a doctor that's in network, the insurance tells them where to go, and they think they have no choice. And that's just not true. You always have a choice, or you should always have a choice. So that's one of the things that I like to do in our podcast is to educate people that they have a choice, regardless of what their insurance is. A lot of time, they're not told their choices, because those choices are not... Um, how do you even say that? Uh, choices are not advantageous to the practice. Right. So things that are, things are priced, for example, Medicare, they're, they're priced by the insurance company. They say they don't set the price, but they do. It's a contract. It's, you know, here's the price, here's the discounted, whatever, but they're setting the price. And so things that are priced too high, people will get more of. Things that are priced, when I say too low, they're, the things that are priced too high are not a bargain. <laughs> things that are priced too low are a bargain, but they won't be offered. Some things are priced so low that they are at a loss. Those will not be offered to people. The practice can't afford to do that very much. You can do it occasionally, but once you start figuring out that you're doing things at a loss, you can't, you can't do that. You know, people, people think you can, but you, you cannot. Uh, so it, it affects in ways that people are not, that's one reason why people don't hear the full range of choice. It sounds very cynical, but um, you have to run a responsible business. And, you know, how much the money part is important to you or necessary. A lot of doctors have unbelievable amounts of debt yeah. when they come out of training. And some of them are important employees and they don't have that option of offering things that are at a loss. I could do it in my previous practice because of the nice practice structure I had, but I was aware when I became aware when I was offering things at a loss. And you know, when you're you're were there work until nine at night, you start saying, I can't do more of that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, that's a whole other topic of conversation when it comes to you know, doctors and the debt they have and then mm -hmm. how they have to go to work for a, you know, a hospital system that they might not like the best, but they, the money is just too enticing. So they negotiated the deal yeah. and somebody else goes out and does that dirty work and they can whine and complain, but they agreed. So I mean, uh, harsh, but uh, no absolutely, fact. absolutely. Um, Steph, it looks like we have a question on, on Facebook. Can you go ahead and stream that question, Dr. Brown? Um, 
maybe a question and a comment, it looks like. So Brian Wetzel says, Dr. Brown, where are you located? I was on the coast of Oregon for 21 years. I am now in the Flathead Valley of Montana near Glacier National Park, and we're going to be opening a mobile. It's going to be very innovative, but we're not open yet. We're, we had some supply chain issues in getting our vehicle done. It'll, it'll awesome. be great. Well, well, we'll stay tuned for you to be open. Montana Dermatology, correct? And Calsville. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And he also said, amen to choice. Yes. And that's a, that's a good one. So other than treating cancer, what would you say, um, what, what do you have a passion for treating other than, other than cancer? Diagnosing, um, accurate diagnosis of all sorts of things. This is a lot of very common things, things people come in self-diagnosed accurately, such as acne. Occasionally, you know, it's not normal acne, but, um, psoriasis, eczema, um, but there's a whole range of rare things in dermatology as well, or things that are common that people don't know about and um, accuracy of diagnosis so that people are not getting inappropriate treatment. And that was one of my experiences. I had a young man. What I realized is a lot of people don't really care about how many years of school you had. I, I had 10 years of formal medical education. I have two specialties. Um, they, don't, they don't mostly care about that. That's your affair and not theirs. They care. Are you going to get it right? Are you going to be kind to them? Are you right. going to listen to them? Are you going to prescribe treatment that's helpful to them? Are you going to explain things? All of those things. I had a young man who had been to three other practitioners, um, doctors, etc. And, um, you know, I said something about, you, you know, that person's, you know, not a doctor. I'm free market. I'm like people can have a choice of who they see. And my eyes were opened. He did not care about that. He wanted to know, can I, can you tell me what I have? And it happened to be something very easy for me and had been mis, mis, you know, diagnosed, not diagnosed correctly by three other people. So that you pay attention. You can know all sorts of things. If you haven't listened long enough to hear what that person feels is important that you know, you may miss things. You, you not only may miss things, but the person doesn't have confidence or trust in you. Um, people don't really necessarily care how much training you have. They just want to know the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> and really what that comes down to is this. And this is this is what he told me. And this is, I don't think this is original. He got it from somebody else. But he said, um, why should I care what you know if you don't act like you care? Ah, yes. Right? And isn't that yes. the important part? And I think in a practice like a direct care practice like like you have, you can take the mm -hmm. time to care. Yes. And, I, and I will tell you just from what I've been told about a lot of traditional practices, and I've been in traditional practice too. It's been many years. Mm -hmm. As a pharmacist, when I was in traditional insurance practice, I didn't care. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't care very much. I mean, I cared, but I couldn't care. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I got out of it. So, um, that relationship, that individual relationship, that personal relationship that you do care is probably the most important part. That you pay attention. You can know all sorts of things if you haven't listened long enough to hear what that person feels is important that you know. You may miss things. You, you not only may miss things, but the person doesn't have confidence or trust in you. So that... I, you know, the whole foundation of all of it needs to be trust. And yeah. you have to establish that that part fairly quickly. You've never met this person before, maybe. And, uh, you know, why, why should they trust you? I think the third-party payer mechanism makes you less trustworthy. Yeah. And not for everybody. You can, for a while, you can, you know, buck, buck that. But depending on how difficult, you know, Medicare payment has been flat you know, when I got out for 10 years and half my practice was Medicare. So you're getting squeezed, you're getting hurt by it. The more that you care, the more, the more that you're hurt by it. And people think that it's, you know, doctors are just, you know, have an easy, easy life or, you know, make tons of money, depending on your practice. Uh, not necessarily. Your, your doctor right. may be kind of suffering to care for you. Yeah, that's absolutely right.
Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you got out of the traditional practice and did direct care because, um, you know, I think one of a, a direct pr primary care doctor told us once on our podcast, he said, in order to fix the system, he had to get out of the system. Yeah. And unfortunately, I, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, the system is so big that it's hard to fix. So, but that doesn't mean you can't still be a great doctor. Um, it's just much easier if you're out of the system. Yeah, it depends on your particular situation that you're in, whether whether you've reached a point where, but, but I think you should still be honest with yourself. Am I providing the best care? There was a Canadian physician a few years ago, emergency medicine, who said, I, I've gotten to a point, I'm just going to say, we're not providing great care. And, and I just, I at a point where I don't have another option. I'm in Canada. I for emergency yeah. medicine. Yeah. I'm just gonna be honest and saying this is not this is not what it should be. Yeah, and that that makes it a little. And when you're in emergency medicine, and you're in Canada. It make it a little bit more difficult to to get out of the system. I mean, depending you know. on the particular emergency room and how busy it is. Right. Right. The individual sure. situation that you are in. So as we wrap this podcast up, Dr. Brown, um, what do you have a passion for other than dermatology? <laughs> Outdoors. <laughs> Outdoors. Uh, music. My husband and I would play piano. Uh, we love awesome. music. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, you move You move to a great place in the outdoors, um, Kalispell. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we usually make a couple visits to there a year. We got a, I got a pharmacist friend there, and there's great mountain biking there in the summer. So I try to make it there as much as possible. Yes, it's recreation. I, I shouldn't even say. <laughs> yeah, our own our own yard is just walking in. We have 50 acres walking in. Awesome. The it's incredible. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So um, we will stay tuned for your practice to open up a mobile practice called Montana Dermatology, and um, you'll keep us informed. And um, maybe when you're up and going, we can have you back on the show and you can talk about how things are going. We are going to stir some stuff up. I love it. I, I love disruptors in healthcare, right? We're going to help some other people do it too. Yeah, that's love another it. passion, helping other doctors who I love it. Like that's to pay. That's what I love about direct care doctors is that they are so willing to help other doctors get into it, even if in theory they're competing directly with them. And we I need think, more. We need absolutely, more. Absolutely. We can't have enough. And I think in reality, mm -hmm. Dr. Brown, the more we have, the better it is for all, including the patients, of course, because I, I believe in in the um, movement that much. The more, the better, because a lot of people, it's still... We know about it, and that's one of the goals of our podcast is to let other people know about it. But mm -hmm. still, overall, in the healthcare system, it's a pretty small movement, but it's not going away, and it's getting bigger all the time, and it's because of doctors like you. So thank you. Thank you. We have a direct primary care doctor, and we're very thankful to have, to have her. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for thank tuning you. in today. Thank you, Kathleen, uh, Dr. Brown, for all your information on Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you so much for listening.